so thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we've been doing with the Weaver Labs project over the past, uh, well, it's a year and a half since you open sourced it, but it's been a project that's uh, almost three years in the making. So uh, I think I've already explained the value proposition of Interop and probably to this audience it's not really necessary. You have, uh, uh, we have a lot of different uh, networks out there which uh, run different limited workflows uh, and these networks are built on permissioned uh, DLTs and uh, the problem is that once you build such networks, uh, they acquire life of their own and you don't really want to uh, expand or merge them with other networks for various variety of reasons, maybe privacy, regulatory, performance, auditability reasons. But in the real world, these processes, the processes that these different networks run, like uh, a trade logistics network, uh, uh, and a payments network, and a KYC network, they all are symbiotically related to each other. So there needs to be a way for these networks to, uh, so these networks eventually discover a reason to have to uh, uh, interlink or interoperate with each other. So what uh, we are trying to do with interoperability is enable the seamless flow of data and value across different kinds of networks built on heterogeneous uh, DLT technologies uh, so that they can, uh, they can uh, uh, conduct uh, transactions and uh, do useful things without being limited by the network boundaries. And we want to do this in a way that preserves their trust and security tenets. Uh, uh, all of uh, being able to uh, orchestrate uh, or enable cross network linking also uh, enables scale without forcing merging. So that's really the what I want to uh, leave you with on the slide. Uh, now different people have different views on what uh, on how to achieve this. So um, uh, and people have different uh, have had uh, expressed different opinions on uh, the very definition of interoperability. Now in the previous panel I talked about what my definition of interoperability is. Let me just show you a couple of uh, other views on uh, what people think it is. So interoperability can range from, uh, uh, it can range along a spectrum from uh, uh, dif uh, and these uh, and different kind of solutions or different kind of uh, opinions can uh, 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 can be expressed as to the level of centralization or the level of trust that uh, they uh, they require or they use when they are trying to interlink two networks together. So if you look at the uh, the first pattern here, you can imagine having uh, interoperation across different networks by just uh, say take uh, multiple fabric networks. Now fabric networks are composed of peers that are owned by different organizations. So you have a single organization that participates in multiple networks. You can imagine it running a peer that has access to all the different networks ledgers, right? So you can build an application that harnesses the information and the contracts on these different ledgers in order to do something useful. It's a form of interoperation, but again, it serves just that organization that is running the peer, right? It does not serve the networks collectively. So that's uh, uh, one limitation of that. Now, uh, another pattern which people have talked about as interoperability is the uh, is ability to have uh, different uh, peers uh, running on different kinds of uh, uh, hardware and uh, uh, cloud infrastructures to be able to uh, communicate or, or to be able to achieve consensus on blocks uh, as part of a single network. That's another valid definition of interoperability, but that's really not what we are talking about here. Uh, the way that people were, uh, one way that people were advocating how interoperability ought to be done when we stepped into this field was, uh, why not have uh, applications uh, running on different networks? That is, at, this is layer two or the client layer and they just expose APIs and thereby you can link uh, the, uh, the contracts via these applications. The problem with this is, in effect, you have, uh, we have reduced a network to, uh, 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 or we have reduced a network to a trusted proxy, which is really, which is this application. Uh, the individual networks still run on decentralized principles, but once you bring two networks together, you have in effect created a centralized uh, scenario. So we don't want, we don't, ideally we don't want that. Uh, so what we wanted to try and achieve was a deeper level of uh, interoperation where networks can uh, interact with each other in a decentralized manner uh, without uh, requiring any kind of trusted proxy. That is the applications would continue to run on their respective uh, ledgers, but they would not, you would not use any of those applications with say a, uh, using a particular wallet identity 
as a, a, a trusted conduit to a different network. So, uh, what exactly are we trying to achieve? So, we uh, one, uh, our observation was that we could, in effect, boil down uh, the different kind of scenarios you want to achieve across networks to three kind of patterns: data sharing, asset exchange, and asset transfer. Data sharing means the ability to communicate. Uh, ledger records across two distinct ledgers and to be able to link two different smart contracts together. I will show you an example in the next slide. Uh, asset exchange, uh, simply to understand, you want to be able to swap assets across, across ledgers and you want to do this in an uh, atomic way. Asset transfer, you have an asset on one ledger and you want to move it to a different ledger for some business purpose. So, how do you achieve that? So, data sharing, here is a model. You have two networks. Network 1 has, the, there's a contract that's implicit here, but there's a data record that's on the, re, on the ledger and network B uh, uh, is running uh, another contract or a business workflow which uh, for some reason needs this data record on this particular network. Now what would you do ordinarily? Uh, you could have, uh, network B would ordinarily just have a, a process whereby a client, some client would be trusted to fetch this data record from this network and then supply that as a transaction to this network and this could validate it right before commitment. Instead of that, uh, if we can have a process by which network B can in an institutional way uh, request this data record from network A and then get a response which is generated uh, along with uh, state proof and using network A's consensus and further before network B uh, consumes that information, it also pro validates that information using consensus that would be great because what you have achieved now is a way by which we, we have created a thick pipe between these two networks uh, whereby information can flow between groups of parties without requiring any other trusted proxy in the middle and uh, the two networks now can be in sync and this can be very useful in a lot of scenarios. One of which I will point out here is here is a trade finance network. Okay. Uh, it, it, this diagram looks complex, I will just give you the elevator pitch. The trade finance network processes letters of credit using it's an instrument by which uh, uh, when a seller or an exporter ships goods to uh, a buyer or an importer, the buyer is obligated to make a payment to the seller. Now, in order to for the seller to ask the buyer to make a payment, the seller has to provide some evidence that they have shipped the goods. So, where does that evidence lie? Now, in the real world, as it happens, we have uh, networks have emerged to handle trade financing, something like processing letters of credit, separately from networks that handle the shipping part of the whole trade life cycle. So in the real world, shipping involves both uh, uh, processing consignment, documentation as well as financing, but you have different networks that are uh, doing these different tasks. So you have uh, the evidence of the seller having shipped the goods on this particular ledger, on the trade logistics ledger in the form of a document called a bill of lading. On the trade finance uh, ledger, you have a document called the letter of credit which uh, needs a valid bill of lading in order to uh, ask a buyer to make a payment to the seller. So, what can we do here? If you look at uh, this uh, arrow, uh, step number 11, sorry, yeah, uh, in step number 11, if the trade logistics network can supply a bill of lading to the trade finance network, then the trade finance network knows that it uh, that is uh, that uh, the seller has dispatched the goods that it uh, was obliged to and therefore the buyer needs to make a payment to the seller. In the absence of that, what would the trade finance network have to do? It would have to depend on the seller to provide a bill of lading, but then the seller has an incentive to supply a fake bill of lading in order to get payment from the buyer. So, by having uh, these two networks uh, link and uh, one network fetch uh, a data record from the other network uh, through an interoperation channel, uh, we can avoid these kind of hazards whereby one particular party can hijack a, a business workflow. Uh, in this particular workflow, we also added another step whereby the trade logistics network can fetch a bill of lading or, or a valid letter of credit from the trade finance network. So, uh, we have shown that because uh, this particular example is not limited to like bills of lading or trade, but it's really, it, it can be generalized to any sort of data record, any sort of artifact that you would want to share across two different ledgers, across two different business processes. Okay, asset exchange is a case where, uh, is a 
very different case from data sharing, but it's also a part uh, one of the uh, building blocks of interoperation. You have in network A, party X owns an asset M, and network B, party Y owns an asset N. And the outcome you want is uh, Y gets M from X in the first network in exchange for giving N to X in the other network. Now, what is the challenge here? The challenge is that this needs to happen in an atomic manner. You don't want uh, the final outcome where this transfer happened, but this does not happen, or vice versa. So, doing that across two different ledgers with which have completely different governance, which are completely ind uh, independent of each other, that is a big challenge. And as an example, there's a delivery versus payment, uh, which you heard in the previous panel. Uh, one network manages uh, bonds, another network manages uh, currency accounts, and if you have two parties A and B, which have accounts on both, uh, on both these ledgers, A can uh, sell a bond to B on one network in exchange for payment on the other network in an ato atomic manner, if this kind of uh, an asset exchange feature were available. And finally, the asset transfer case feature is one where uh, you want uh, one party in uh, one network to be able to transfer an asset it owns to a different party on a different network. I mean, in this case, X and Y could be the same, but uh, in the most general case, they are they can be different. So, what's happening here is that the the asset gets expunged from one network and gets uh, recreated in another, maybe in a somewhat different form, but an equivalent form, something which both networks have agreed is is an equivalent form. So, that uh, is another uh, basic use case of interoperation. And as an example, you can you can just imagine two. Uh, central bank digital currency networks and uh, if you have uh, one party wishing to make a, a transfer CBDCs uh, from its account in one network to another party CBDC account on a different network. Uh, and this can be generalized to any other kind of asset. Let's see, I'm doing a time. Uh, okay, so these interoperation modes, uh, our claim is that uh, any cross network process interdependency can be realized as a combination of these, uh, these scenarios, data sharing, asset exchange, and asset exchanges, and asset transfers, uh, collectively can uh, cover like almost all of the use cases you imagine when you bring two different blockchain networks or two different DLT networks together. And uh, uh, just from a modeling perspective, we can think of it in this way. You have a, if you imagine dependencies across networks, uh, you can imagine unidirectional dependency uh, uh, where uh, a read in one network uh, triggers a write in another, and that is the data sharing use case. And then you can imagine bidirectional dependencies where uh, a write in one network uh, triggers a write in another, but that's uh, uh, both have to happen atomically, and that's. And the two uh, kinds of uh, uh, scenarios we're talking about there are asset transfer and asset exchange. Okay, so there are unique challenges we face for DLT interoperability, which we did not face in the traditional uh, centralized service interoperability case. Uh, mainly that uh, the authority over state lies in a collective and uh, the protocol or the consensus protocol that the uh, employee to ensure its integrity. So if it is just single party, uh, as long as you trust the party that is supplying information or that is transferring an asset to you, you're good. Interoperability is just a matter of uh, uh, ensuring that both of you follow the right message formats. But when it comes to two multi-party networks, it's not so straightforward. Uh, you have to be able to trust the information that's coming from a network, and you cannot really boil it down to uh, trusting a single peer in that network, because a single peer can always lie. And every network is geared to guard against a single peer lying, but what does the foreign network do? Because the foreign network does not participate in the consensus protocol of a given network, right? So that's the really the main challenge. Uh, now, when we were uh, starting to investigate uh, uh, Weaver, we uh, we saw uh, solutions that were out there which involved uh, this kind of pattern. So the pattern here I'm showing is the you build yet another blockchain or a settlement uh, network or settlement chain uh, to which uh, you can. Uh, uh, your network can plug in as a as a side chain, and then via the settlement network. So uh, the settlement network provides the assurances whereby two different side chains can do the kinds of uh, things that I talked about. They can share data, they can transfer assets, or they can exchange assets. But the problem with this, or uh, at least one drawback with this, is that you have to depend on the settlement chain, and 
there are uh, the way you connect or plug into this uh, ecosystem is intrusive. You need uh, validators that are uh, belong to the uh, settlement network that have to be part of your network and they're, they're privy to your private information. So this kind of solution works if all of these networks are already open public networks. But for uh, private networks, this seems to us like a suboptimal solution. How do you get private networks? How can you enable private networks to be able to interoperate uh, without having to uh, uh, surrender their uh, sovereignty in some ways to another network and also and, and to guard the privacy? So that was the challenge we set out to solve and we, we wanted to achieve something like this and we, uh, this is what we have, we have done uh, in the past uh, three years. Uh, so for, uh, as an example, you can see uh, what we want to do and what we can do with Weaver is uh, allow two networks to directly interact with each other without any kind of uh, settlement network in the middle nor any kind of trusted proxy. So that is, uh, we feel that's a uh, less constricting uh, way uh, of uh, an, uh, doing interoperation and for permission networks, this is really the more optimal way of uh, doing interoperation. So to give a brief history of the Viewer project, it began as, a, as an IBM research project in 2019 and uh, uh, we identified the kind of use cases that we thought were uh, uh, covered the, uh, the spectrum of interoperability. And uh, end of 2019, we built uh, a prototype linking two different fabric networks that are modeled loosely on the trade lens and the V-Trade networks. And we published a paper in Middleware that established the, the basis and the engineering, engineering principles for such interoperability to happen. Uh, in 2020, we extended support for uh, Corda networks you may wonder why we picked Corda after Fabric. It was because we wanted to pick a, a kind of DLT that was as different from Fabric as was possible, just to show that the approach that we were researching would work and that the principles that we were uh, trying to uh, enforce uh, were applicable to any kind of DLT, regardless of what kind of tech stack it is built on. So uh, we, we did that and then uh, later in 2020, we built the first version of Weaver with, we made it, uh, we, we cleaned up the code, we, we wrote proper RFCs and we made it, uh, we made the code quite modular. And uh, finally in the uh, in, uh, early 2021, we open sourced Weaver under Hyperledger Labs. Uh, since the latter part of uh, that year, we've been having discussions with the Hyperledger Cactus team. And as I think you all know, you know now, uh, we're going to merge Weaver with Cactus to form Hyperledger Cacti. So, there's some links here I'll come to, I'll show you the links towards the end as well. So just a shout out to our, our team. We have, uh, between us we have four uh, researchers and developers uh, who are working either full time or part time. And then we have uh, Vinayka who is our uh, research manager and, and thought leader. He's been involved in the space for, for four years now. Uh, so Weaver is uh, built on uh, several design principles that are really, uh, we want, uh, that are really important to understand. And we wanted to make sure that we built a system that uh, satisfies these. Inclusiveness means that we do not want to build a system that uh, enforces uh, uh, a particular approach that uh, tied to a given DLT. So we do not want to build Weaver to be a fabric-like interoperability solution or, a, or an Ethereum-like interoperability solution. We wanted it to be completely neutral to that. Uh, while accommodating both Fabric and Ethereum and Corda and, and what have you, and any network that you can, you might envision creating in the future. Uh, the networks we wanted to be, uh, we, we wanted to ensure that the networks retain sovereignty over their own governance processes and their access control rules. So uh, if you imagine interoperability of the kind that I talked about, sharing data, exchanging assets, transferring assets, there is some uh, sort of intrusion happening in a network. So you cannot actually allow the uh, no network, especially if it's built on, a, on the permissioned uh, principle, it would not want anybody to uh, just poke into its network and say extract an asset, right? Whatever is happening in a, in a cross network scenario has to be fully under the control of a network. So access control is really a core uh, primary uh, feature that we wanted to provide for the networks when they are in a cross network scenario. Uh, Minimum trust, I will talk about this. Uh, uh, the net, uh, any interaction between parties to networks should be private and confidential and only revealed to the interested parties. Uh, we do not want to rely on any intermediary, uh, whether it be a, uh, 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 sorry, whether it be a 
trusted third party or a common settlement network. Uh, any shared infrastructure we relied on would be minimal. I say minimal because we ended up discovering that we need uh, 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 data infrastructure, for example, in order to be able to establish a trust basis for two networks to interoperate. So that's something that uh, I don't think I have the scope to cover today, but I'll just uh, leave you with that and we can have uh, offline chats on that if, uh, if, you, if you're interested in it. Uh, we wanted to leverage we wanted a system or an interoperability system, uh, protocol which would leverage the native consensus protocols of the respective networks rather than using any other kind of uh, consensus mechanism. The uh, whatever is happening in the respective networks should respect and follow the consensus rules that have already been set out. We did not want to uh, impose uh, any other kind of consensus logic over what was already supported. What this ensures is that uh, any interoperation enabled using Weaver would be as trustworthy as the network's existing uh, transaction commitment processes. Uh, and we finally, we did not want to require any changes to the core DLT platforms. So uh, Weaver does not require uh, a fork of Fabric or of Corda or Ethereum or so on. So these are a laundry list of principles, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we provide a solution that, uh, uh, that, that uh, ensures all of these because we believe that th this constitutes an optimal set of requirements for uh, permission networks. So, okay, I have, uh, I think uh, I have time, uh, have time till six, right? That's uh, what time do we end? Yeah, so uh, let me see how much I can cover here. Uh, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, we have a tokens workshop tomorrow where we will be covering uh, uh, scenarios where Weaver was actually used in a, in a real experiment and that involved not just Weaver, but the Fabric token SDK as well. So uh, if I can't cover some uh, protocols, uh, please try to attend that workshop and uh, we will be covering that uh, tomorrow. So Weaver, this is the vision. You have a network and with Weaver, uh, what Weaver adds to a network is uh, uh, something called a relay along with the protocol driver using which it can communicate or interact with a different network that similarly employs a relay and a driver. And the arms of the triangle simply show the three different interoperation modes, asset transfer, data sharing, and asset exchange. And what exactly is the relay? The relay has two different parts. It has, uh, the, uh, it has a completely DLT neutral part to it, which is a communication protocol whereby two different relays can talk to each other, exchange messages, and do all of the good things you expect from a message uh, management entity like message queues and everything. And then there is a DLT specific portion uh, uh, called a driver, which is necessary for uh, to uh, uh, either query a particular network or to commit a transaction in a network. And because those queries and those commitments are very specific to a particular DLT, like uh, uh, you would query or commit a transaction to Fabric network in a very different way than you would communicate, you would do it in a Corda network or an Ethereum network. So the protocol drivers understand the DLT protocol, the relay part of it does not. The relay part of it is uh, just running a completely neutral uh, protocol, which is DLT agnostic. Uh, so Views are, is a concept that we introduced, which is uh, akin to the views that you would, you can imagine in a traditional database, right? In a database, a view is just uh, uh, some procedure that you run to extract some data from a database. So we are just extending that concept for cross network scenarios. And we are, uh, what uh, the core feature that we've built in Weaver is the ability for one network to generate a, uh, to uh, supply a, uh, view address, which looks something like a URL, and which it can communicate to a different network, and uh, and then that network can supply the information uh, by parsing this particular view address. So this is a feature whereby you can uh, run queries across networks, and uh, the, the this is part of the building block of uh, all the protocols uh, that Weaver uh, provides. So if you can imagine this uh, simplified uh, network network communication, you have two networks consisting of a group of peers and the relay is communicating, uh, uh, enabling communication across them. So the relay supports the ability to address uh, remote views. So network this network can supply a view address for this network to this relay, which can then 
uh, communicate with this relay which will then fetch a view corresponding to that uh, uh, view address and supply it back to this network. So, you can have an end to end request response protocol that way. Uh, and uh, we can also we uh, imagine uh, doing more complex operations across networks like having a contract in one network invoke a contract in another or uh, publish events and subscribe to events across network boundaries. So, the relays there act as communication uh, modules and the networks act as uh, uh, validation and commitment modules. Uh, moving to what the networks are doing further, here is the set of operations that each network uh, needs to do in order to uh, run the kind of protocols that we want. Uh, access control, the ability to generate proofs uh, of ledger state, the ability to independently validate such, such ledger state proofs. So, if one network generates some proof, the other network must be able to independently validate that without having to uh, let us say offer uh, uh, get privileged access to the ledger of this network. Uh, the networks must be able to lock or pledge assets uh, and then they be able to claim them. So, if you attended the interoperability uh, formalization uh, uh, presentation a couple of hours ago, the ability to lock an asset is a, a key uh, enabling feature for uh, either asset transfers or asset exchanges. Uh, without the ability to lock assets, especially in a time bound manner, uh, a network cannot be deemed to be interoperable. But uh, most proxy networks today have the ability to do that. So, that is something that uh, we can rely on when we uh, augment a network with weaver capabilities. So, our claim is that there is a complete set of building blocks to realize any cross network dependency. So, uh, I mentioned the three uh, modes or the three different kind of use cases that Weaver supports. Uh, data sharing is simply the ability to generate and verify proofs and there is a request response protocol across two different networks to enable that. Uh, one network uh, requests another network uh, for some ledger data, the supplying network generates pr uh, proof associated with the data and the consuming network verifies proof that accompany that particular data. So, that uh, request response protocol <coughs> achieves that uh, uh, the data sharing property. Uh, asset transfers, uh, the way we have engineered this protocol involves multiple such data sharing instances and uh, the uh, we, we do not have time to go into the full protocol which will involve uh, probably an uh, at least half an hour of discussion, but uh, please uh, uh, reach out to us or look at our documentation for uh, information about this. Uh, asset exchange is something that we have built on the hash time lock uh, contract mechanism. If you are familiar with that, I think uh, if you attended the Casper Labs uh, uh, demo earlier today, they talked about the hash time lock mechanism whereby uh, if you have Alice and Bob that wish to exchange assets across two different ledgers, uh, they can uh, use uh, this protocol which involves generating a secret and then uh, producing a hash out of that secret in order to lock assets and then claim them in a way whereby neither Alice nor Bob can cheat each other because that is really what you want to enforce atomicity. So, we implemented that protocol in Weaver and at present we are working on uh, augmenting that protocol making it more uh, fail safe and automated. So, the Weaver architecture uh, consists of these components. So, let me just uh, mention what you would need to do as a network administrator and as a developer. As a network administrator, you will have to deploy a relay and a driver which automatically comes with Weaver. Uh, all you need to do is take the uh, relay and driver from the Weaver uh, code base, build it and you just need a configuration file that you have to adapt, sorry, you have to adapt to your particular network. Uh, the interoperation module is again, uh, it is a built in the style of a contract or a DAP. So, in fabric, this is built as a chain code. So, all you need to do is to deploy the fabric interoperation chain code on your channel and your network will be uh, weaver enabled or interoperation ready. In Corda, we supply uh, this equivalent uh, of this as a Corda app and uh, there is a Corda distributor application and it performs similar set of features. What are the set of features? I mentioned that a couple of slides ago, generate proofs, uh, validate proofs, uh, lock assets, claim assets and so on. Uh, finally, there are application helpers or library functions which allow uh, any uh, client application to be able to trigger uh, transactions using uh, the uh, in order to share uh, to make two networks share data or to be able to to trigger uh, an asset lock or an asset claim 
or an asset transfer. So, uh, yeah. So this is uh, the difference between a traditional fabric application with uh, the peer smart contracts and the layer two and uh, we were in a we were augmented one. You can already I think mentioned this. I won't go into the details. I think I want to yeah I want to stop in a couple of minutes for uh, questions. Maybe we can go into the other uh, parts of it in the Q and A. Uh, let me just cut to the yeah. So Weaver provides, I mentioned the SDK that Weaver provides. So what does this look like exactly? So suppose you want to uh, trigger a cross-network data sharing request. As a developer, you can use the Fabric Node SDK. Now in Fabric, uh, we offer, for Fabric Networks, you offer the SDK both in Node and in Go. In Corda, we offer it in uh, Kotlin. Again, these are the native languages that you would use to program on the respective DLTs. So in Fabric, uh, to be able to trigger a cross-network uh, data sharing request, as a developer, you just need to call this interop flow function. Now, this has, it has a laundry list of parameters, looks complicated, but it's just a single function. It is sort of like submitting a job. So what you would do is you would create a view address. You would, uh, that's one of the parameters of this interop flow function. And uh, what happens is the query goes to the relays. It goes to the other network, proof is generated, then proof comes back and a local commitment is triggered and the proof is validated and committed, assuming everything goes right. So all of that happens via just this interrupt flow function. So we are trying to make it as easy for the developer as possible to run the cross-network data sharing. Uh, similarly, this is, the, this is for uh, 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 the equivalent for a Corda network. It's the same interrupt flow function. You have again a list of parameters. So <clears throat> I'm going to skip those, these. Okay, so what is the status of Weaver so far? We have, uh, as you can see, uh, we need uh, some common appliances. The relay as a common appliance exists. You need, we need to build drivers for every DLT uh, separately. So right now we have support, we have drivers for Fabric and Corda and uh, uh, we are trying to build a driver for Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, we have uh, more support for Fabric and Corda as compared to Bezu at this point, but that's something we are actively working on. Uh, we recently we added even PubSub support for Hyperledger Fabric Network so that uh, from one Hyperledger Fabric Network you can supply, you can subscribe to events that uh, of uh, some operation that happened in a different Fabric Network and the other Fabric Network would then uh, channel those events uh, or publish those events to the subscriber. Decentralized identity is something we've been working on as a trust basis for these uh, interoperation to happen because uh, what we need uh, in order for two networks to be, for two permission networks to be able to uh, generate and uh, validate proofs is uh, be able to uh, know who their respective certificate authority certificates are and validate any members of those networks against those CAs. So we need the ability to uh, communicate group identities and uh, CA certificates across networks. So that's what this particular feature is all about. <coughs> so uh, for to contribute to Weaver, you can uh, or to use Weaver, you can just go to the documentation. We have uh, tutorials that uh, uh, help you get uh, the Weaver samples up and running from start to finish. Uh, the instructions are all perfectly clear. And also, if you have uh, an existing network you want to adapt for Weaver, you, there are instructions for that. <coughs> if you want to contribute to Weaver and uh, or gain more information please uh, uh, there are, go to the RFCs folder or read research papers that are in the overview page. I, I promise they are fairly easy to read. Uh, so in the real world, uh, th this is something I mentioned yesterday as well and uh, uh, I'm not going to talk in detail about this. Uh, uh, to find out about the use case uh, involving CBDCs uh, and the experiment done by the Bank de France and HSBC, do attend the tokens workshop tomorrow and you'll get uh, all the uh, download on that. Uh, so Hyperledger Cacti, uh, again, I think uh, this audience by now knows uh, what's going on with this. So we have been talking to the Cactus team, team since late 2021. And uh, I talked in the uh, earlier session about what the merge framework will uh, roughly look like. Uh, this is something that's still in the works and it probably takes a few months to, to complete. Um, 
there is standardization effort going on. Again, this is something uh, Rafael and uh, Dinakaran talked about earlier, secure asset transfer protocol. And there's several links here for your uh, inspection. I think this is the most important. Uh, we do solicit involvement from anyone with an interest and an opinion on this topic. So please subscribe to the mailing list. Uh, you're welcome to join the weekly meetings at uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time. And uh, just to uh, uh, give you the report on what's going on, the aim is to form an official working group under the IETF. And we made a presentation under a birds of feather session at the last meeting uh, just two months ago. And uh, uh, it was quite well received. Uh, and at this point, we're in the process of refining the, uh, the charter and uh, making sure that it gets accepted as a working group at the next meeting. So the goal of this is this effort is to uh, use is to uh, create or offer network gateways that are compatible with a uh, universal DLT and app neutral protocol whereby two gateways working for on the behalf of two different networks can communicate with each other and they can trade assets or uh, communicate data with each other. Uh, if we uh, the, the these gateways are trying to keep the networks behind them opaque and make sure that uh, we are not uh, hamstrung by any particular uh, DLT protocol. That is uh, 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 the this gateway to gateway protocol or what you call SATP is not specific to Fabric or Ethereum or Corda and so on. So that's what we have and uh, uh, we have several features in the pipeline. Again, one of the major things we're going to be doing is merging with uh, Cactus. So that's going to occupy our time for the moment. Uh, so thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions if uh, we have time. Please, can you come to the mic? I think uh, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very informative. Um, for the Besu connector that you guys are working on, is that targeting EVM compatible chains in general or specifically Hyperledger Besu? So far, specifically Hyperledger Besu. But uh, in the long run, again, depending on how many people can contribute, we would like to be able to expand uh, support for generalized EVM too. What does it take uh, At this point, I'm not exactly sure. I think Dinakaran can probably offer a more informed opinion. We, are, we have been trying to understand uh, what's the best way to uh, build a, uh, a driver for Bezu, and uh, it's, it's a, it involves somewhat different logic from what we've used in both Fabric and Corda. So uh, I don't have a, a complete answer to that right now, but if you, okay. if you can, yeah. Yeah, the question I'd ask is what, why, what would restrict it to Bezu? So unless you're using private transactions or um, the privacy modes, if you just stick to JSON RPC and the standard Ethereum uh, calls that are in that and the standard EVM contracts and don't rely on any specific basis specific precompiles, it should transport to any um, EVM JSON RPC system out there, okay. um, whether it's uh, Geth or whether it's Avalanche or, or some other chain like that. Good. That's great to hear. Thank you. I'll just respond here. So at this point, uh, it doesn't seem like there is anything that's restricting to Besu, okay. but maybe we'll run by the architecture that we have, the plan that we have with you. And okay. yeah. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? Please. Uh, have you uh, thought uh, uh, have thought about uh, fault tolerance for this uh, relays and gateways? I mean. Uh, is this just one uh, node, or do you think that uh, the gateways can be uh, multiplied somehow? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, great question. So, I did not cover uh, that part here. Again, it's uh, it's more of an uh, uh, we yeah the engineering of a relay would can go on for as long as you want. But yeah, we can have multiple redundant relays. We can have multiple redundant drivers. The uh, uh, for fault tolerance and for failover. Ideally, in production, you should have multiple relays. You should not depend just on one relay. Uh, I mentioned early on that the relay uh, uh, was, by according to our design principles, supposed to be a trustless component. That is, it's not trusted uh, to uh, uh, as a. It's not. It should not uh, end up being a trusted proxy. So our protocols ensure that uh, any data that's going over the relay is already encrypted, and it's already signed, so that. Uh, when you get the data at the other end, that is in the network across the other relay, then the decryption happens only past the relay 
and the signature validation can also happen there. So the relay is already trusted to uh, or doesn't need to be trusted to, uh, to not mount man in the middle attack for example because it can't. Uh, at least modulo the strength of the cryptographic algorithm. Uh, but yeah, for uh, it could potentially mount a denial of service attack, but for that you should have uh, enough redundancy in your relays. And Weaver uh, allows you to configure multiple relays. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I will mention one more. So the asset exchange protocol that I mentioned is uh, we, we have built the support for the HDLC protocol or the hash time lock protocol. Uh, that by itself uh, has some uh, points of uh, uh, inefficiency or vulnerability and what we are trying to do uh, with one of the Hyperledger uh, uh, interns who's, uh, uh, who's been working with us over the summer uh, is try to add more automation and failover to the HDLC protocol. So this involves doing some research as well as doing some redesign. So we hopefully, uh, one, one of our goals is to be able to build an HDLC actually an augmented HDLC protocol that can actually work in production because when you talk to uh, different clients, uh, companies or governmental institutions, they are, they are really concerned about the performance of asset exchanges. Uh, so uh, if we can provide a mechanism whereby we can guarantee that uh, asset exchanges will happen and because the basic HDLC protocol kind of depends on, if you think of Alice and Bob as the two exchanges, Alice and Bob just doing the right thing at the right time. Uh, and Alice and Bob have incentive to do so, but in the real world, uh, uh, at least when you're uh, using this protocol for a lot of financial transactions, you don't just want to depend on that. You want the system to be somewhat more robust. So that's what we are trying to do. And uh, in order to build a more robust asset exchange protocol, we are building uh, capabilities that involve the relays communicating information about locks and, and proofs and enforcing uh, 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 claims even if let's say Alice or Bob fail to do so. So uh, again this is a longer discussion but uh, just in a nutshell uh, HDLC as we implemented right now depends on users driving the protocol but we are instituting more automation failover. Uh, any other questions? Okay I guess yeah it's been a long day and uh, yeah we are over time. So, see you all at the Guinness, what is it called? Storehouse? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.